Welcome to Bible study with the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church. We offer a weekly video online with a reflection on a certain passage of scripture. And then we gather in person at 9.30 a.m. the following Sunday morning in our church library for an ongoing discussion of that same passage with any students who are interested in joining us. So today's video will be discussed on August 11th, 2024. As we turn to our reading, let us first join together in prayer. Almighty God, we open scripture looking to learn more about you. We seek to learn more about the faithful who've come before us and to better understand how we can be disciples of Jesus Christ today, sharing the good news and living our faith in a way that honors you. It's because of your Holy Spirit that scripture has been recorded and passed down as your truth across the generations of time and place and people. And we are grateful that we have scripture today to read and learn from. Guide us now as we seek not only to read your written word, to reflect upon it, but also to be open to your spirit's leading. We ask this all giving thanks in the word made flesh in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we've been talking about King David for a couple weeks, and now we're going to shift in talking about King Solomon. So King Solomon is the son of David, the son as a result of his marriage to Bathsheba, and Solomon will then rise to power. So this passage is about the passing of the crown or the passing of the authority from David to his son Solomon. We are reading in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, beginning with verse 21. The next day, they made sacrifices to the Lord and presented burnt offerings to him. A thousand bulls, a thousand rams, and a thousand male lambs, together with their drink offerings and other sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. They ate and drank with great joy in the presence of the Lord that day. Then they acknowledged Solomon, son of David, as king a second time anointing him before the Lord to be ruler and Zadok to be priest. So Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king in place of his father, David. He prospered and all Israel obeyed him. All the officers and warriors, as well as all of King David's sons, pledged their submission to King Solomon. The Lord highly exalted Solomon in the sight of all Israel, and bestowed on him royal splendor such as no king over Israel ever had before. David, son of Jesse, was king over all Israel. He ruled over Israel 40 years, seven in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. He died at a good old age, having enjoyed a long life, wealth, and honor. His son Solomon succeeded him as king. As for the events of King David's reign, from beginning to end, they are written in the records of Samuel the seer, the records of Nathan the prophet, and the records of Gad the seer, together with the details of his reign and power and the circumstances that surrounded him and Israel and the kingdoms of all the other lands. Now, First and Second Chronicles are books in scripture that chronicle the history of the Israelite people. So they're presented like factual, chronological litanies of important facts, genealogies, census records, how a building is built, how a military siege occurs, the order and structure of genealogies and authority and leadership in the kingdom. Now, first and second Samuel are written more as narrative or a story, or like a novel about the history of Israel. And then First and Second Kings talks primarily about the reign and rulership of the kings of Israel. But First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles cover the same passage of history in the story of God's people, but from different perspectives. Similar to having four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John cover the same time period, but from different lenses or perspectives or different voices, the same as an eyewitness account, if you and I 
saw the same event, attended the same concert or play or movie, and then were asked to retell what we'd witnessed, there would be some similarities, some verbatim exactly the same things that we shared, and then some details that you chose to share that I omitted, and vice versa, things that I bring to prominence that you omit from the retelling of that account. So as we read First Chronicles, this passage today, it tells about the changeover of power from King David to his son, King Solomon. And it frames it as a very peachy, rosy, wonderful event. No one objected. Everyone partied. There was lots of drinks and food and festivities and all of Israel celebrated and everyone was joyful. Yet if you read the account of some of those other books I mentioned, there's a rebellion by Adonijah, one of Solomon's brothers, another son of David about who should rule next. We know that David's reign as king is not all rosy, that it has the realities of lying, of an assassination, of adultery, of the death of children, of the profaning of God's holy activities and holy relics as David gets self-centered rather than God-focused. It also tells of repentance and foolish worship and just abandon in front of God because of worship and prayer. We know David oversees the writing of the book of Psalms that's still used in our worship life today, litanies and liturgy and poems and hymnity, music for worship, some of praise, some of penance, some of prayer, some of lament, some telling the history of God's people. And all of this is wrapped up over a 40-year reign for David. And now Solomon is taking the throne. And Solomon will be known for his wisdom early on in his reign. And at the end, when he becomes the author of Ecclesiastes, of his dismay or folly of the reality of realizing the mistakes he's made and wanting to own up to it at the end of his life. So neither David nor Solomon are perfect rulers. Neither are perfect followers of God. Neither are even just perfect friends or husbands. They are imperfect people, like you and I. They're sinners who give in to temptation, but their lives are on full display because they are the king. Just like today's politicians and celebrities' lives are on full display, the good, the bad, and the indifferent, every action they take becomes sensationalized front page news. If you or I had our lives recorded, documented, and publicized every moment, there would be some unpleasant truths about us. There would be some triumphant realities about us. Most of it would probably be pretty mundane, everyday things. Maybe not as spectacular as the kings of Israel, but certainly things that could be criticized, critiqued, or affirmed and celebrated by onlookers judging and critiquing the choices we've made. So the author of Chronicles is known as a chronicler, someone who chronicles, writes down the kind of history, bullet point, factual story of a period of time and the leaders of that historic moment. He also says that some resources for what he has written come from Samuel. So we have first and second Samuel in the Bible. And also Nathan, who is a prophet, mentor, friend of David. Although we don't have a book of Nathan, he's mentioned in scripture. And then Gad the seer, who's mentioned a handful of times, but we have no writings from Gad. These writings have been lost to history. Most likely because what either Nathan or Gad wrote was redundant to what we do have in scripture in 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. It was unnecessary to also include those source materials. Or possibly they were just lost to time or maybe they were written in a way that wasn't as valid or truthful. Maybe it was a skewed perspective, kind of writing with a different intent, not for recording history, but maybe for lifting up one particular motive or agenda or affinity the person had. But isn't it amazing that we have the stories at all? That these events that happened almost 3,000 years ago are still written down, still shared, still studied 
by cultures and people around the world, those who are faithful and those who are not, those who are seeking them as historical archaeological resources, those who look at them and think of them as fiction or just novel writing that's interesting to read, those who look at them as faith-filled documents, those who base the foundations of their beliefs about the one true God based on what they read in these pages. As we look at scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, as we look at extra biblical writings, you know, writings by other cultures and other people that weren't included in scripture, but are written at the same time period, that either affirm and confirm what's in scripture, or maybe make us see how some things maybe were written from a certain perspective or point of view, we are asked to wrestle with God's truth, with what was written long ago about people and places very different than ours, and how the lessons that we see in scripture then affect our faith and impact our life and guide us in our witness to God's truth today. And we might also want to reflect on if someone were to chronicle our faith journey, if someone were to write about how we are showing forth our faith to the world, what might someone a year from now, a hundred years from now, or like this passage, 3,000 years from now, think about our faith story. I invite you to continue the dialogue and discussion and reflection on the scripture with me and other students when we gather this coming Sunday, August 11th at 9.30 a.m. in our church library here at the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania. We also will gather for worship every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. here in our sanctuary, and we record that worship service for later online broadcast. You can find our worship services, Bible study, and other resources on our church website, eppchurch.org, or by searching for us on YouTube or Facebook. Thank you for joining me for this time of reflection on scripture, and we hope you will continue to study God's word with us.